So basically, I'm just going to give you not much of a historic view, just a little bit of a historic view of sort of where the center has been. And let's see if this works OK. Oh, actually, before I do that, um, this being the Affiliates Forum, and the Affiliates being key to the growth and success of the center, uh, the first thing I wanted to do is say thank you. Um, this, I believe, is a picture of the board over in, in on our own building, right on, the, right on the other side back there. And I guess most important thing is thank you all for your participation. Without your support, we wouldn't be where we are today. And now for the program. So I have, in theory, an hour and 15 minutes. I will try to keep it a little bit shorter so we have a little bit of a break. Then what we'll do is we'll have sort of a panel discussion. And we have three people here to talk about the future of upstream HVAC programs. And each of the people represents a different part of that equation. Uh, we have someone who's actually not here yet from San Diego Gas and Electric who's in charge of sort of looking, fo looking at how the utilities will address upstream programs for HVAC. Um, then we have Paul Kylo, who's here from a third party provider of programs for utilities. And then we have Dick Lord from a manufacturer from Carrier to provide a manufacturer's perspective. And so that, that's what that will be up next. Then we have lunch, and I think I know the logistics. Uh, so Paul, you can correct me, it's okay, if, uh, if I've got it wrong. But basically, we will get lunch in here, and then you can wander over to our building, which is just the next building over, right there, and you'll be able to walk around, and each, each of, of the various engineers and researchers will have stations, and you can go around and you can talk to them and have posters and you could get an update on what kind of research is going on. I will talk a little bit about things during my talk, but you, if you want details, um, they'll be much better at it than I will be. Then in the afternoon, um, we'll have, oh, and by the way, when you get your lunch, you can spend a few minutes here eating prior to going over there, because we, when we did this last year, we had a little bit of an issue that none of the staff were able to eat because they quickly ran to their stations and they weren't able to eat lunch. So eat for a few minutes and then, then wander over. You've got an hour and a half, it's, it's pretty flexible. Um, so then after lunch, we have another panel and this panel will be the future of refrigerants. And we have somebody from Daikin, we have somebody from Train, and we have somebody from California Air Resources Board to give you different perspectives on where we see refrigerants going uh, with, air, with air conditioning systems. At 2.30, we have Jonathan Woolley, who was here, was, he was the first or second employee. I forget if I hired Teresa or, or Jonathan first. Um, what's that? It was a tie. All right, right, okay, there you go. And Jonathan um, is, Basically, he, he's gone back to school. He decided we weren't you know, educating him enough. So he's going, he went, he's going to school at Berkeley. And so this, this will, could be his last affiliates for him. So we decided we would give him um, a period to, to give you a chat. Then you have a break, which is really exciting. And then after that, what we'll have is an emerging technologies programs update by Jareen Ahmed. And then we'll also have David Hungerford, David Hungerford from the California Energy Commission talking to, you, uh, talking to us about, for Andreen's case, emerging technologies within utilities. In David's case, some part of emerging technology within the California Energy Commission. And then finally, and I presume all of you have already signed up. If you haven't, please find Paul um, and let him know. But we have a complimentary dinner at the Bicycle Hall of Fame starting at 5.30 this evening. And so, and that's not very far from here. You can actually walk. Um, I will probably go ride my bicycle over there. Um, but, but I would say, I don't, Paul, have we, do we have anything about parking? Do we know about parking there or not? Uh, 
Okay. Okay, if you didn't get that, right, we'll, we'll try this again later. Okay, so this is, we managed to fit everything we've done on one slide. I, I, I guess that doesn't, that doesn't look so good, does it? Um, but, but I will say that it's not, exactly, it's not exactly everything we've done. So, as we mentioned, April 7th of 2007 is when the WCEC was founded. Um, I started, um, the, the line's a little bit off. I started on January 1 of 2008, and in, I, I could use a, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'll use this guy. Is that annoying? No. Okay. So, basically, one of the first things that we did is we had an affiliates forum in 2008, which was kind of interesting. I got here, and three months later, we had an affiliates forum, and I wasn't exactly sure what we were going to say. Um, then we started something called the Western Cooling Challenge, and that was our first sort of big initiative at the center, and that was started in 2009. Um, in 10, we began the development of the aerosol sealing technology, and you'll hear a little bit about that. Um, our first academic publication was actually about using swimming pools as heat sinks for your air conditioner. Um, our first master's student, the first graduate student, is sitting right here. I was almost going to point this at you, Nelson, and I realized <laughs> that, that, that I could get in trouble for that. What, 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 oh, there's a little caution thing in the back. Do not point at any of your staff. Um, so Nelson was our first, our first graduate student, and he's, he's still not, not managed to escape. Um, a big deal is that we moved to West Village the beginning of 2013. So we've now been here in our current space for four years, something like that. And our lab, it felt so big when we got here, and very quickly it became too small. And so, and right now it's currently still too small. Um, the Honda house, back on the other side, that was a net zero energy house or po positive net energy house. Uh, Jonathan was instrumental in designing the HVAC system for that building. Um, it was also one of the first places where we tried out the aerosol sealing technology in a real building as opposed to in, an expen in, in a, uh, a test chamber. Um, it took us, as you can see, about a year to get our environmental chambers going from when we moved here about a year later. Um, another big event is we hired an associate director, Vinod. Where are you, Vinod? Raise your hand. And we've been working over the past, I guess it's two years now, to get him to drink as much of the Kool-Aid as possible. And I, I think it's going okay. Um, he, he seems to be, uh, so he hasn't run away yet, so I think that. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but Kool-Aid is the drug of choice when you're trying to hypnotize people. Um, and our first PhD student graduated in 2015, and we don't have it. I'll tell you in a little bit, we graduated two more PhD students last year. And one thing that was another highlight here is we've started to do more on the outreach side. Um, there are now nine videos on the CEC website, and I think at the end of this, I'm gonna tr attempt to play a little clip to show you. Um, we've been making videos for the CEC on how to meet the Title 24 codes. So we did residential, and now we're moving on to, to doing commercial. And as far as I can tell, people really like them. Um, I, I think kudos here go to Paul, who has been sort of our outreach coordinator, who's becoming the outreach coordinator for the CEC, effectively. Not quite. Okay. Um, at this rate, I will use up my, all my time. So, so in our first 10 years, in terms of student development, um, we created two new courses at UC Davis. There's a course 
on building energy performance. That was the first course I created here. It's in civil and environmental engineering. And then a couple of years later, created a course for on HVAC in mechanical engineering, which there never was one in Davis before. And so that, those I think are both very good things. Over the 10 years, we've employed over 50 undergraduate students. Um, uh, it says from around the world, UC Davis is not a foreign country as far as I know, but the other ones are. And we, we've, we've brought on uh, students, but, and actually we have, in some ways, we get way more requests for students who want to come visit and work here than we can support, than we can keep entertained. Uh, but in, at any given time, there are 10 undergraduate students probably working within the center. And that, that has been, I think, a really good, a really good thing. So in terms of grad students, we have six grad students who've graduated, uh, basically doing all their research at the WCEC, three PhDs, and three master's students. And I do think it is somewhat interesting in the current times, the fact that all three of our PhD students were from out of the country, right? We have, we have one, from, one from China, one from Italy, and one from Iran. And all of our master's students, so I guess Americans decide they don't really need a PhD to stay here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how that works. Um, I didn't list here all the various reports we've written for utilities and for the California Energy Commission, but we just highlighted on the academic publications, which as far as a university center goes, were not excessively academic, but at least academic enough to have put out 17 publications over that time. And so that's, and, and what, the point I guess I want to get across here is there over a fairly wide range of, of topics. We have evaporative cooling, we have a couple of papers on the swimming pools, uh, some papers on the water energy nexus, which I think are particularly important. I've talked about that last year a bunch. Um, a pre-cooling test protocol, ground source heat pumps, only one paper on aerosols, um, and then Paper, a bunch of papers on thermostats and behavior. That's what happens when you have a PhD student who likes to write. So that worked out well. And then there's a couple of papers on duct leakage, which are leftovers from my previous lifetime. We've also managed to put out some patents. Um, the first patent was for a ro roll-up radiant mat. And that was by Dick. And that was for Walmart. We basically came up with a patent to how to re completely reduce the cost for putting radiant floor inside a concrete slab. And made, I think, the, what was the factor of the cost reduction? Factor of three? So that's a, that's a factor of three patent. Um, aerosol sealing of enclosures, I think it could come in like about a factor of two patent. Where basically what we did is we figured out how to use aerosols to seal leaks in buildings instead of having people run around with caulking guns. And we have another one that we've not pursued as rigorously as we'd like, but I think it has a big potential, is aerosol sealing of pipelines. So basically, use little particles to seal leaks in the natural gas infrastructure or any sort of bur buried gas pipeline, perhaps even compressed air systems at some point. We have another patent for a tracer gas measurement tool, basically a way to measure uh, airflow inside different systems uh, with a very large dynamic range very accurately. One on dryer controls, basically for, for either an electric or a natural gas dryer. There's a, bun there's a bunch of problems with basically getting it to turn off when it's supposed to turn off. And uh, Teresa, came up with an idea for how you can do that. And my little add-in was to say, by the way, by using her idea, we could also even weigh the clothes and from that actually calculate a sort of an efficiency metric. So you could know how much electricity or how much gas you used per pound of clothes that you dried. And then finally, one that I filed recently, it's for system performance for heat pumps, basically, if you'd like, I mean, all of you in the HVAC industry have, have known for years how difficult it is to sort of know what your equipment's going to do in the field. 
And so what, we, what we've done is we've been doing these experiments uh, in a joint project with EPRI uh, for the CEC where we've been measuring the performance not just of the equipment but of the equipment plus the duct system. And basically what we're finding is that when you include in the duct system, you need to change the controls for that system significantly if you want to maximize efficiency. And so I filed for a patent for that, and it looks like that's at least the preliminary, uh, they, they do a search and analysis, it looks like that's likely to go forward. Okay, so I know I said I, everything we did was done in one slide, but I've tried to expand it, make it sound like we did more. Um, in terms of expertise that we've built up over the 10 years, I would say we've done a very good job of creating a niche for climate appropriate cooling technologies. Uh, the particular climate being California, um, but California is not unique to the world. Um, we've analyzed and tested and developed evaporative cooling technologies of all sorts. Uh, we've spent a bunch of time characterizing water use and looking how to manage that water use, and I think that's been really important to this industry. You already heard about our lab. The one thing that sort of sets our lab apart is that we have a unique ability to produce hot, dry climates. So most labs are basically set up that they can test for hot, dry conditions in the winter because they don't have any moisture removal in their system. In our system, we have a desiccant wheel, and that allows us to produce hot, dry conditions even in the summer, right? So we can do our testing sort of pretty much year round. I think the number is like 92% of the year. And then we, I, I don't think this is unique to our lab, but as far as I know, we're the only people who did it who stuffed an entire duct system into the hot side of the chamber and used it to test system performance. In terms of field testing, I'll talk about that a little bit. There's a little map of all little dots of where we've been doing field testing in California. Aerosol sealing, I think we're the only place that, do, actually that's not true. There's a place in uh, Birmingham, England that's starting to do research on, on similar type topics. Uh, but up prior to that, we, we've basically been it. On the energy modeling side, we've developed significant expertise in Energy Plus uh, for hybrid cooling, which you'll hear about from Jonathan, but also on net zero energy and multi-tenant light commercial. Basically, how do you run millions of simulations of non-residential buildings and figure out what's going to happen and what, what kind of retrofits or designs you should follow? We've also developed expertise in behavioral research. Uh, Sarah, sitting back there, she's our queen. And then we've also started to do more and more on the policymaking side, uh, much with ASHRAE, but also with uh, Title 24. Oh, I forgot one thing. We actually started an, Ash, uh, an ASHRAE chapter at UC Davis. So there's now an ASHRAE student chapter at UC Davis that was started last year by some of the students from my course. And I think, I think that, and they're starting to go to ASHRAE meetings and participating at the local, at the local uh, chapter meetings. Okay, here's a, little, here's a little map of sort of field studies across California. And different colored dots represent different, different types of field studies. Um, what you can see is obviously there's a fairly, fairly high concentration close to home. It's cheaper to stay close to home. But we've also done a lot of work with, with SCE in Southern California, and this would be sdg &E, I presume, down there. And I guess the one point I want to make is we've looked at a bunch of technologies in the field and developed an expertise to be able to come up with credible third-party test results. In addition to that, um, we've been working on the East Coast and in Minneapolis. Um, much of this was with the aerosol technology. And then we've also done field studies in Dubai and in Tokyo, and that was on the behavioral side of things. I don't think we did any actual measurements there, but it was, it was still a field study. Okay. By the way, I know I talk a lot, 
But if you want to interrupt me, you have any questions, whatever, feel free to do so. Um, I think that we'll, we've, we're okay in time. Uh, so what I decided to do is just give a little bit of a highlight on some of our current projects. So I'm not going to go through and uh, at any given time, we've probably got 20 to 30 projects running. And the ones I picked are, it's semi-random. Some of them were picked because they're not going to be shown in a poster in the other space. Some of the pick because uh, I they happened to catch my fancy at that time, or I thought that, or I thought that you might be particularly interested in those projects. So, um, if, if there's a particular project that you thought I should have highlighted, it's all my bad. You know, it's my it's my fault. So, on the climate appropriate cooling side, I decided we'd talk about evaporative precoolers since we had a sort of a major life event um, as of like three weeks ago, and so we'll talk about that just a little bit. And um, that's a pro that effort's been pretty much funded by Southern California Edison. Um, and then the other thing that's going on, and this is sort of a rather a new development at the center, is we figured out that we're part of a larger university. And being part of that larger university, there are people here who know stuff that we don't know anything about. And so we decided we can play with them, and we can play in their sandbox, whatever, and, and work together on different kind of projects. So one of the projects I'll talk about is a project together with the Animal Science Department on cow cooling. Um, I know sometimes people think that cow cooling is what we do in buildings, but not quite. Um, another thing I'm going to talk about briefly is, and this is part of the reason I picked this, it's partially because in the, ten, in the spirit of a 10-year anniversary, when I was being interviewed to take the job here at Davis, um, I thought of, on the spot, in the interview, the idea that you should be able to dump the heat from your air conditioner into a pool. And so now this is 10 years later. Um, we, did, we did some stuff early on, but now we have a current project together with SDG&E where we're, where we're going in and doing it in a, in a, in a hotel in a, commercial, in a commercial environment. I'll talk about that just a little bit. We're also working with the School of Public Health on indoor air quality. And in this case, it's looking at K through 12 schools. And the idea is looking for energy efficient HVAC and IAQ at the same time. And I think there's a few interesting results we can talk about today. This is, uh, I, how would you say, a very reason I put it up is rather a current topic uh, from a legal perspective. And that is that indoor farming is a euphemism for uh, in cannabis growth. Um, since there, there are different forms of indoor farming, however, the value proposition for cannabis is so much higher, and the concentration of, of such indoor farming operations has, is, is about to explode. And we had a project, a, a very small project we did for Excel. Uh, Excel, in case you don't know, uh, they're a utility that serves Colorado. So they're at the leading edge of that curve. And now we're, we're seeing the same thing is likely to occur in California. And we're looking to help with making that be energy efficient. And then, of course, I can't give any talk without talking a little bit about aerosols. Um, but in this case, we've got a couple of new events that I think are worth talking about. And so I'll go ahead and do that. So anyway, that, th that's all you're going to hear about on the technical end. Um, the rest of it you can get from the posters. Um, just let me do a little time check. OK. I think I'm OK. Oh, sorry. And then we've, we've got a little, a little bit on outreach and training. We'll talk, I, I hopefully, technically, it should work. As long as we have a decent internet connection here, we should be able to pull up a video and show you a sample of what we've been doing for the CEC. All right, the risk of boring some of you, um, uh, what is an evaporative precooler? Probably most of you know this, but in case you don't, um, it cools outdoor air entering air conditioner condensers by evaporative cooling. So it's direct evaporative in front of uh, the condenser on an air conditioner. The power draw decreases, 
and the cooling capacity increases when you do that. SCE has been supporting us in this effort for, I'd say, five years now at this point, at least, at least four. Um, PG&E and SMUD have been doing parallel efforts, but not, they're not funding us, but either internal funding at, at PG&E or external at SMUD. We've done field testing of performance, but the big, the big news is that we've spent a lot of effort, including people from PG&E and SMUD and SCE on the committee in ASHRAE to develop a test standard for these, these devices. So basically, there's now a way, and well, okay. Let's just, one more click. It doesn't, it's not official yet, but if you've got, I'd say 30 days to put up or shut up. So basically what happens is it's out for public review by ASHRAE and if you're interested and you, want, you have a hard time finding it, I'll be glad to point you in the right direction. You can download the standard for free and you can scribble all over it, you can make comments, you can say whatever you want about whether or not it should work, we, we did a good job or whether it should look a different way. But this is sort of a major accomplishment of sort of a good four years of work trying to figure out how do you come up with something that treats different technologies fairly and is not, doesn't require a PhD thesis to do, the, to do the project. So then the new thing here is that um, there's, a, there's a big concern about sort of the duck curve and all of the issues with controlling the grid. And so one thing that we've been doing on the current project for SCE is to look at the potential for dispatchable pre-coolers. And the idea is that anybody here has been familiar with, in the, in the past, there were programs where you could, the utility would pay you so much money per month to have the right to turn off your air conditioner. Well, the idea here is that instead of turning off your air conditioner, they would simply send a signal that turns on the water on your evaporative precooler. And so when you do that, there's no disruption to the customer experience. In fact, their capacity to cool goes up. It has a minimal water use impact, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And we've completed the lab testing on that, and we're currently planning a field test on Walmart stores this summer. So we'll be We'll be doing this in some stores um, in Southern California this summer, and I'm gonna talk a little bit right now about the lab results. So what we have in this picture, whoops, that was not what I wanted to do. What we have in this picture, this is time, and this is sort of whatever performance variable, capacity, uh, power draw, and what we do, or COP, let's, let's, let's imagine COP for the moment. I'm running along, and then I turn on the water. So it says pre-cooler turned on, and then I'm gonna get a new steady state, and then I turn off the water, and it should go back to its previous operating point. So this is an artist, artist rendi rendition of what should happen, and this is what we actually measured. And so here what you have is you have power draw in kilowatts, and then I turn on, I turn on the pre-cooler, and what you see, the three different colors are, or I think if I should click this one more time, oh no, there it is. The three different colors represent different temperatures. So this would be at the hottest outdoor temperature, a little bit cooler, a little bit cooler, and basically what you can see is well, how long does it take? This little time period there, how long does it take before it responds? Utility says, I want you to reduce power, power draw. How long does it take to happen? And then when you turn it off, what you can see, it's a little slower to recover, but that's not a big problem. It's not like you're in a big rush to have it, have it tur turn off. So to put this in perspective, what we have here is time in minutes to achieve 50% of maximum power reduction. 
And so basically what you can see is you get halfway there within roughly a minute, uh, may maybe a little bit less than a minute. 75% takes you about two minutes. If you want to get all the way to 100% power reduction, clearly this is, you know, we're talking 15 minutes. That's a much longer time. So the way to look at it is you can get 75% of what you paid for, or you can say, I'm only going to pay for this within, within a couple of minutes in terms of being able to get your system to, perform, to reduce its draw on the, on the grid. I think it's important to note that this is, all, all this represents is the immediate power draw of the equipment. It doesn't represent the fact that its capacity went up, so it might actually turn off a little quicker. Right, that, that's, not, that's not captured here. In terms of water efficiency, what we have here, this is a water energy index. So this is gallons. It was multiplied by 10, right, so it fit on the same scale. Um, gallons per kilowatt hour. And basically what you see is the hotter it gets. So this is going from 95, 105, 115, the amount of water it takes to save a kilowatt hour goes steadily down. So the more extreme the conditions, the more value you get in term for every bit of water you use. And also, the size of the COP increase goes up. So at 115, we're looking at a 60% change in the COP of that piece of equipment, which is, in my, my view, quite dramatic. So the best impact and water efficiency occur at peak conditions. So the point is, if you go to turn it on at that time, that's when you get the most value sort of across the board. Now, to be fair, it's worth noting that th there's a financial trade-off here. If you're a customer and you buy one of these evaporative precoolers, that evaporative precooler could save you money all year round. But if you don't run it and you allow the utility to turn it on, when it wants to turn it on, it obviously, from a water perspective and a performance perspective, that's the best time to use it, but financially, and so the interesting part of this, how, will, how does it play out in terms of a, a business proposition or value proposition? The other question that you could ask is, well, if I put this thing on my air conditioner and I'm not using it most of the time, is it causing a problem? Is it, is it going to reduce my efficiency because I've got this device sitting on my air conditioner? And the short answer is that this is the coefficient of performance as a function of outside temperature for a baseline and with a dry pre-cooler. And basically what you see is at least for this particular product, there was no discernible negative. So it had a minimal impact when not operating. So for the field test, we're going to go to an existing installation of, oh, sorry, this, uh, let's go back a little bit. This is a dual cool unit. So this one is an evaporative pre-cooler, which is what we've been talking about, that also cools the ventilation air indirectly by pumping the sump water. And so there, there's an existing installation of these on units of five to 20 tons in Southern California. We're also gonna work with a planned installation of additional condenser air precoolers on six RTUs. And what we'll do is we will control to dispatch the entire rooftop of precoolers and then measure exactly what happens. So essentially, we're gonna reproduce what we did in the lab, but on a real building in the field, um, because no matter what you do in the laboratory, Everybody cares where the rubber meets the road, which is an actual building. Yes, Jonathan. Mark, you mentioned that at the same time, there's an increase in cooling capacity from the system, like the security of the block, basically, they can just lose that factor. So I suspect that the field test would be able to measure that effect. And do you have any estimates of how much larger, say, the wheel on a car? it's gonna depend upon sizing and where you are with your load. So in other words, what Jonathan is asking is the field test should capture the effect on COP 
not just the impact on power draw. So in other words, I turn on the water, just the electrical demand goes down, but the capacity goes up. So the effect of that capacity going up, you should see it here if equipment is turning off, right? If it's running sort of flat out, right, then you're not going to see it. But if it, if it is sized correctly at that load, you should see, and to give it a rough estimate, it should be about a factor of two. So in other words, if you look at when you turn on when you turn on the water, the power draw goes down by so much, and the capacity goes up by so much. And those percentages, it's order of magnitude, 1% per degree F for each, maybe 3 quarters of a percent. Sorry, my phone, I forgot to silence it. Um, so does that make sense to everybody, what I'm saying? So basically, what happens is when I turn on the water, what you're going to see is you're going to see a 1% per degree F outdoor temperature drop. So roughly speaking, if I have a 30 degree wet bulb depression and I have, oh, let's, do, let's do a 40 degree wet bulb depression. If I have a 40 degree wet bulb depression and I have a 75% evaporative effectiveness, I will get a 30 degree drop in the temperature seen by my condenser. For that 30 degree drop, if it's 1% per degree F, I would see a 30% reduction in the power draw. At the same time, I will see a 1% per degree F increase in capacity. So roughly speaking, I would see a 30% increase in capacity. So order of magnitude, right, 30 plus 30 is 60%, which is what you saw in the previous plot that I showed there. And so we should see that in the field but we won't necessarily see, we won't necessarily see all of it because it depends upon if, how systems are running. If they're, if they're running flat out, if you're topped out, what will happen will be, it will turn off a little quicker, but it will not, it will not actually see a, a reduction during the peak period. What's your wish beyond effectiveness? It depends upon the technology. That's what our, that's what our, our ASHRAE standard is doing. But for the evaporative precoolers, we measured like four of them at about 70%, okay. percent, and one or two back in like 35%. Yeah, I think a partial hunt for our report was 50, 60%. Yeah, we're, we're doing some studies now. Oh, okay. That's why I asked. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's a bunch of them that got you 70. Okay. And it's, and it's relatively independent of wet bulb depression. We have, it's, it's been pretty, pretty constant. Right, at the different, because we tested different conditions in the standard. Yeah? Yeah. Well, well here, here's the answer to your first question. It's right there. For this particular technology, we looked at the COP with the dry pre-cooler installed versus no pre-cooler. And there's your COP. So ba basically, at least for this particular technology, excuse me, one second. Okay, at some point in, in developing our standard, we looked at the possibility of trying to look at longevity impacts, but we decided that if we ever wanted our standard to get finished, um, we had to like punt on that, because it's very difficult
to determine that. We looked at putting little swatches because I'm not convinced that humidity is going to cause that much of a problem. Water droplets, that's a different story. But actual humidity, it's just different molecules in the air. Yeah, right. I understand, but you don't have a mixed eliminator after those three years. So you would have some water that comes to it. You don't know what is your reading cell velocity across the condenser tank. What is the cell velocity in the media? And oh, that, that's much better. And since <laughs> three is more than like 700 meters per cubic meter per second, you should have some water carrying on to get into the condenser. Okay. I understand. I would be glad to chat with you about it, right? But I, 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 the short answer is we did not, we, we thought about that, but to try to quantify that in a standard and come up with something that could test all the different types of systems, because some of them have drift eliminators, some of them don't. How would you go about measuring that? We even looked at putting little, I think it was little pieces of paper you could put on the fins of the condenser coil and you could figure out if any liquid water were going through. So in the standard right now, it's got, it says, we're not addressing these things. And that's one of the things we're not addressing. We are not telling anybody how to do anything in the standard. No, what, no I'm, I'm serious. It's, it's a performance measurement standard. It's not a design or recommendation standard. So we just point out, this is what you're measuring. This is what, this is what uh, you can compare you know, A with B with C with D, but not tell you you should be at X or you should be at Y. OK. Um, all right. Well, I now need to speed it up a little bit. Sorry. Not, not trying to discourage people from chatting about things, but okay, we're, all right, now let, let's switch gears, right? So now let's talk about cow cooling. So this is funded by uh, CEC's EPIC program, um, and the idea is to develop an optimal approach to cool dairy cows under California summer climate conditions the objective is to use much less water and less energy and to demonstrate on a pilot scale two ways that we're looking at doing this. So the project team is, is us. I'm not the PI on this. Vinod is the PI on this project. Um, we're also working with the Department of Animal, Animal Science. We're working with an equipment manufacturer. That would be Integrated Comfort, who's here as well as with a dairy consultant. And so let's put this a little bit in perspective. So California has roughly 1,500 dairies, 1.8 million cows, and most of them are located in the Central Valley. And this is something I didn't know. An average cow produces eight gallons of milk a day. And the key thing that's important is this production generates a lot of metabolic heat. And so you know all those ads you see for happy cows? Well, I mean, happy cows make lots of milk. And, and, and if you let them get too hot, right, that doesn't work so well. So you have to keep your cows cool. So what happens, so here's, here's a picture of a bunch of cows um, in their favorite environment, I'm sure. Um, what happens if the heat load is not managed, all this metabolic uh, heat? Well, body temperature goes up, milk production goes down, reproduction fertility goes down, disease risk goes up, mortality goes up. So basically, it's not good to have hot cows, right? We want to we want, we want, we want cool down our cows. And so what is the baseline approach for doing this? Basically. Here's your standard cow. There's a little puddle. Um, there's a sprayer, you can't see it that well, that's spraying water that's puddling under the cow, and then you turn on some fans. Um, so here's a slightly more realistic picture, right? There's your cows, there's the sprayers. 
And here they are inside with the fans. So we don't have the sprayers and the fans in the same picture, but they, they do exist that way. So you have sp sprinklers over the feed bunk and the milking parlor, and fans in the bedding area and the milking parlor. It's one of the top three water uses at a, at a dairy, right? So basically, um, and this was particularly salient before we didn't have a drought for however long that's gonna last. From an energy perspective, you can see that in the summer, you're using way more energy for uh, California dairies, and it's a peak in summer, so it looks just like air conditioning in terms of peak energy use. So the proposed solution is to go from this to a cool mat under the bedding so the cow can lay down on the cool mat or if they want to stand up, right, they can have radiant cooling on the underside. And then to have the water, in this case we're using a sub-wet bulb fluid cooler to create a cool mat. Then you can run the chilled water into that mat, come back, cool it down, send it back again. And then we have direct evaporative cooling and you can blow the, the targeted convection cooling on the cow. So the idea being that you can use essentially ev evaporative cooling, but sub-wet bulb evaporative cooling to keep the cows cool. So just to show that it, we don't just draw pretty pictures, here's mats installed. This is at the UC Davis uh, Dairy Science Center. And here's one of those sub-wet bulb evaporative uh, coolers. So we're currently commissioning the test with cows at the UC Davis campus and the planning a field test in Tulare. Um, to put this a little bit of perspective, the goal is 30 to 40 percent energy savings and 70 to 80 percent water savings, right? So a non-trivial, non-trivial impact. Okay, now, now we're in the Whitman sampler part of the presentation. So in terms of swimming pools, we started out, that's actually Marshall Hunt, who was one of the initial members of the cooling center. Um, that's his swimming pool. And we were doing, we were, we were trying to validate a model for predicting the temperature inside a swimming pool under natural conditions. In other words, not dumping any heat into it. We then went and did a demonstration at a house in Sacramento where we took the air conditioner and used it to heat the pool, and we measured how, the, how well the model worked when you were dumping heat into the pool, but we didn't measure the efficiency of the air conditioner. It was a, rather a small project. And so now, this is at a hotel in SDG&E service territory. We're doing it on a commercial building. Um, well, I guess they, we, know, we even said what kind of hotel it is, a Wyndham Hotel. And the idea is supplemental pool heating with heat rejection from the air conditioner. And we'll measure the reduction in natural gas use required to heat to maintain the pool temperature and also measure the efficiency of the air conditioner. Now, I, I know this is fuel switching, maybe, um, but too bad. Um, all right, shifting gears, shifting gears again. So now, let's talk about energy efficient school ventilation. So the idea of this project is to assess current ventilation and IAQ performance and potential for improvement for HVAC retrofits in schools. Anyone here is familiar with Prop 39, knows a lot of that money went into lighting, some of it went into HVAC, and what we were doing was looking on the HVAC side of things as to how well what they're doing is working. Um, and I guess I have to give some thanks here to the Sheet Metal Workers Union. Um, you got all those nice school districts to give us letters and say they would play, they would play with us, and they did. And we were able, we were able to, to basically access the schools in order to do the testing we needed to do. 
So the objective was to characterize retrofits completed between 30, 2013 and 2016, including satisfaction surveys. So not just measure energy use, but how, how do people like them? Then to deploy and test energy efficient retrofits and use simulations to investigate the implications of those findings. So we'll do some, some field tests, we'll take those findings, plug them into simulations and try to extrapolate that to the rest of the state. In this case, we have the cooling center, including Sarah, which is our behavioral search scientist. Um, School of Public Health, uh, there's, a, there's a lady named Deborah Bennett, and she's doing the IAQ side of things. Um, the Energy Efficiency Center, right across the way. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory is also doing IAQ work, particularly on the modeling side. And then we have train, Geary Bard and IQ Air as partners on the technology side for this one. So the research questions are ventilation rates, higher rates reduce CO2 levels, so that's a good thing. High rates increase heating and cooling needs, not a good thing. And higher rates also increase the intake of outdoor air, which can also not be a good thing, right, depending upon where you are. In LA, you have to worry about people bringing in, oh, not people, uh, the system bringing in ozone. In the valley, you have to worry about particulates. If you want to filter that air, either to pull out ozone or to pull out particulates, there's going to be a pressure drop and therefore a, a power, power penalty associated with that. So of these, ventilation is good here and then it's all bad there. So the idea is to be able to analyze the trade-offs. And to date, what we've done is we've gone to five school districts. And as you can see, they're spread about the state, well, a little bit of a bimodal distribution um, where we've done testing. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of those results. Um, the main thing I'm going to do is to point out that we've got a large range of results in terms of how well what is being done. Now, let's be clear. This is not a baseline study. This is a study of schools that have been retrofitted already with HVAC retrofits. Essentially, there are two types of equipment that we looked at, RTUs and wall-mounted units. Um, the one thing really nice about schools is each classroom has its own unit, right? So it's, when you go to a building where there's, how would you say, a lot of zoning and it's difficult to sort of figure out what's happening between one and another, each classroom has its own HVAC system. And so you've got a bunch of them in the same school that you compare side by side. So in this case, here's an RTU that we're looking at and here's an example of a wall unit. Oh, wait, one sec. Before I show that, let's go back one. So the results I'm presenting are CO2 level for classrooms over a four-week period for scheduled occupied hours only. So basically, this is averaged over four weeks only when the students are scheduled to be in the classroom. And so what we have here, this is for one particular school, we've got some of the classrooms they were running the system with, if you're on your thermostat, you know, you can have on for your fan, or you could have um, with it where it oscillates, it goes on and off with the, with the cooling or, or heating, um, in, just like in your house. Well, these ones had it in auto on, which that's, that means it cycle, cycles with the conditioning. This is fan on during occupied hours, and this is fan on continuously. So this is all the same school, but what you see is orange is greater than 1,700 ppm, yellow 1,100 to 1,700, and green less than 1,100. So as you might imagine, it's kind of like driving, right? Green is good, yellow is eh, and, and red is stop, right, or not, not so good. So what you see here is there are quite a few classrooms 
that are essentially way too high in CO2, even though these have already been retrofitted. Switch to another school district, and in this case, nobody is in the red, and a lot of them are sort of all in the green, right? And by the way, just to be clear, this is the percent time during school hours where you're at those concentrations, so in both cases. So in this case, the worst one is 40% of the time it's in the yellow, 60% of the time it's in the green, and here this one, the best one, this and this, are essentially no problems at all. You're below 1,100 all the time. So, hey, Mark. <laughs> to what do you attribute that difference? Is it just, is it just because there are different facilities managers, and some of them are good at setting the fan settings, and some aren't? I mean, it, it's pretty dramatic. Um, I'm, I'm going to punt to Teresa. I'm going to let her answer that because she, I, I, I will paraphrase what she would say, but I, I think. Um, there. Whoa, this one's really loud. Um, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, so just also to add, if you're into the yellow zone, it means that um, you're getting less than the code required ventilation rate. And if you're into the red, you're getting less than half. Uh, on, at the one school we saw, so we're, we're seeing that control systems aren't set consistently. So at times you're not even running the fan when you need to be. Um, another reason is, is that the ventilation systems aren't commissioned correctly. So the damper settings aren't correct, or in some cases not even hooked up. We actually encountered just ventilation systems where the they just were like, well, we'll just skip that part of the installation. And but that's rare, but we did see that. Um, in the one school that was operating well that you saw there, they had CO2 sensors in the classrooms and they were doing demand control ventilation. So, um, and as far as we know, all those ventilation systems were working. Uh, as designed, so there's a there's a bunch of reasons, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm in the interest of keeping with time, I'm I'm going to keep going. Otherwise, I could elicit more comments. Um, one really quick thing we did is one of the issues we're concerned about is we're assuming that all the ventilation is coming through the AC unit, which may or may not be a good assumption, depending upon if the room is being pressurized or not pressurized. So what we did is we picked some subset, and we did blower door tests on individual classrooms. And so the idea is to figure out if classrooms are receiving ventilation that's not going through the HVAC system. Roughly speaking, the, this is a measure of the leakage of the building. They're all pretty good, except for Willows here, which is about a factor of four higher than all of the others, which is an older school. And so in that case, there, I think there's a decent probability. We haven't done all the modeling to see how big it will be, but a decent probability that there's ventilation that's coming from uh, something other than the ventilation system in the building. Basically, the wind blows, it's going to blow in on one side and, and blow out on the other. And at that kind of leakage, it's very hard to maintain pressurization of the space. Um, okay, we, we did a survey of the teachers. Basically, this is just showing sort of a spread. For some reason, we don't like first grade teachers or they don't like us, I'm not sure. Um, but that's not that important. So in the teacher survey, 87.5% reported having a thermostat. In fact, 100% had a thermostat. So. 12.5% of teachers either don't know what a thermostat is or couldn't find it. Um, this is, and I'm going to speed this up a little bit, this is basically a little map of how often they felt they were too cold or too hot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is in the heating season. Previously, it was the cooling season. When we did, in the, in the teacher survey, we asked about satisfaction with the classroom temperature. And it looks like You've got, let's say, 8 plus 30, 40% of the teachers are dissatisfied in the summer, and 15 plus maybe 35% in the winter. 
Um, but then half of them are, are happy or, or really happy. However, maybe these were the ones who either, now one thing you discover in classrooms is sometimes the teacher can control the temperature with the thermostat. Another time it's in a little plastic box with a lock, right? And so they're not allowed to touch it. Um, so not having the power to regulate the temperature to suit student preference means the students are sometimes uncomfortable. Not surprising that you'd see that. Then we asked the, the teachers, do they get sufficient fresh air from the HVAC alone? And this is, I think, a pretty important point. Um, basically, 57% said no. They said, I'm not getting enough fresh air. And I don't know that we, I don't think we've gone to figuring out if these are the ones where, where that had high CO2 levels or low CO2 levels or a comparison like that. But so this data is somewhat fresh. Um, Um, I, I think the way they look at it, they'll say things like, well, the, the classroom seems stuffy, right? Which could be a measure of humidity, could be a measure of whatever they're sensing. And they feel like, oh, I need more fresh air in this space. It's kind of like my wife opens all the windows in the house to have fresh air going through the house all the time. Uh, otherwise, it, it, and, and I don't know what stuffy means. Uh, Sarah? Do you want to uh, chime in on this? Do you have, do you know what? We asked it a range of different ways. Um, so we asked them to report if they find it stale or stuffy or dusty, dirty, that kind of thing. And then we also asked a general question about do you sense that you get enough fresh air or not? We also asked about behaviors that they might do to compensate. So do you leave the door open for fresh air? Do you leave the windows open? Do you run a fan? That kind of thing. So we came at it from a lot of different angles because we find that a lot of times um, personality drives how much you determine whether you say you're satisfied or not. So a number of people who said they're satisfied then also went on to report that the poor air quality um, hinders the classroom performance. I, I'm going to cut you off there. Yeah. You're stealing my thunder. All right, go ahead. Uh, here's the, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead. But here's here are some of the comments. Um, yes, the HVAC is good, but without turning it on, it's very stuffy. Okay, fine. Um, they change the temperature to make sure that they get the air flowing through the room. That could be in classrooms where the ther where the the fan is set to auto as opposed to on. Um, I've never been under the impression there's fresh air coming into my room unless I have the door open, right? So even if the HVAC is running, they don't feel like it's fresh air for some reason. Um, okay, so here's, here's my thunder that Sarah was stealing. So what we have here is a question, how satisfied are you with the air quality in your classroom? And basically, there's only a relatively modest fraction that are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. Then if you ask, does the air quality in your classroom interfere with the learning environment? Yes, it interferes a lot. So if you read this, basically what it says, one sec. Only, I'm only, only a few of us are dissatisfied but we all know that it's interfering with the students' learning. So I, I don't know. Sarah, you, you're going to have to figure that one out. <laughs> that was my thunder you were going to steal. Sorry. Mark. Okay. Hi. Mark, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you have about six or seven minutes. I'll have you know that I have. Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> and, and it says five. <laughs> okay. Um, Indoor farming, dehumidification, basically, uh, I'm going to speed it up here. Um, I don't remember how many more I have after this. Um, but in short, HVAC systems for inside a grow room are typically, they're not the most professional operations. The people will just go buy something and stick it in, 
and you know, put it together with scotch tape and figure out how it works. And what we did is we tested a technology that the idea is it should be able to reduce, but both reduce water use and reduce uh, electricity use significantly. Um, to give it a little perspective, this is comparing, um, this is the energy expended total kilowatt hours per square foot as a function of basically how much water you're putting in. And this is a conventional system, and this is a system we tested. So there's significant savings available. Okay. So my last little bit is on the, on the aerosol ceiling. We have done, what is that, 12 demos in single family homes. We've done a lot more demos. I think the total number of demonstration sites is 61 sites we've done at this point in, in multifamily scenarios. So we've got a project now where we went out to Lodi just a little, maybe a couple of weeks ago, and we looked at new construction. And one of the big deals in new construction is as codes have made requirements to make buildings tighter and tighter, the Builders have to send people around, running around like an army of guys with caulking guns, and then they put in the insulation, and then they, then they hope at the end that it actually meets the spec. So one of the things that's been happening is they've been shifting to doing blow-in insulation instead of fiberglass insulation. And what the, what the blow-in insulation, it's sort of serving as a tightening mechanism as well as, and so the, the guys don't run around with the caulking guns anymore. Interestingly, apparently it's too expensive to use closed cell foam, so they use open cell foam. But it's still tight enough with the open cell foam to, to, to get them close to their spec. So we're actually doing a test where we're going to work with this builder, and we're going to use aerosol sealing at this point in the construction process, which is kind of nice. If you saw in the previous, previous pictures, you saw pictures of little nozzles spread all around a building. And each room, they have these things called walls. And the walls kind of get in the way of the, of, the, of the spray. But in this case, the walls aren't there yet, right? So it's actually a lot easier. And, and it's easier to, to do the ceiling. And so we're doing an experiment where we're going to seal at this point in the construction process so that they don't have to run around and do that. Or they, they might do a little bit of that, they might do this, but probably not that, because we'll seal that just fine. And the idea being, apparently, the increased cost you know, per square foot of conditioned area is about $2 a square foot to do that transition to uh, the blow-in insulation instead of the fiberglass insulation. So that means there's, there's a possibility to A, make them tighter, and B, have to be less expensive for the builder. So it's always a really good thing when your efficiency improving technology actually costs less than the current technology. OK, um, that's what I just said. Um, another thing we did in the past year is we had a project with DOD where we've gone to large buildings. And in case you're wondering, this tent was basically just keep us out of the sun while we were sealing the building. This is the first sort of licensee prototype of a piece of equipment um, that can be used commercially to do this. Um, the, let's go back one. The one thing I thought was quite interesting, when we, would, we did a school building, and we did this school building, the amount of leakage that it had was so much more than you see in houses. And apparently, there's a construction detail, like a really difficult spot. It's called where the roof meets the walls. And where the roof meets the walls, they have one of those nice, cor you know, the corrugated metal uh, roof kind of things. Well, they like don't fill that in all that well. So the first time we tried to seal this with an aerosol, I wasn't there, and I got all these horror stories back that it didn't work at all. And like, oh, we don't know why, and blah, blah, blah. Well, then sort of figured out there's this, this giant gaps like that big. And aerosol particles are less good at sealing, or like, like not good at all. It's sealing gaps like that. So they came up with a really high-tech solution, which was to go in and stuff some closed-cell foam in there. Um, I, 
actually what they were stuffing in was bubble wrap, right? And I, and I didn't particularly like the bubble wrap idea, so I suggested other ways to do it. But long story short, when you did that, then we came back and we were able to seal the whole thing quite well. Um, so this year is the first applications by a subcontractor, meaning somebody other than a UC Davis employee doing this. And also, we licensed the technology in the first applications. The licensee is actually selling it and, and doing not a huge number of buildings, but I think they've already done more buildings than we have, which is good. Um, this just gives you a little bit of an example of this is what it looks like. In this case, we had two ceiling events. And whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. I've got minus two minutes. So we get a nice plot. Um, we can talk about that during the break if you're interested as to what happened. And this is the last thing. Oh, no, this isn't the last thing. Urgh. OK. Um, what this is, is I, we've, we've got a project together with a local sort of Marin County uh, company that makes IoT sensors. And one of the things we've been interested in is getting more into the IoT space. And what we've been doing is working with them to have a diagnostic to measure both duct leakage and envelope leakage with a simple, basically an absolute pressure transducer that you put in the building and you track what happens over time. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. OK. I told you we're doing efficiency standards videos. And let's see if I can make this work. The ventilation rate provided during the fan-on periods is higher using intermittent ventilation to account for the fewer overall hours of operation. Due to the decreased ventilating effectiveness associated with cycling, the total ventilation provided over a 24-hour period is higher than in continuous methods to maintain proper air quality during off-cycles. Before we look at how to calculate the amount of required intermittent ventilation, let's take a look at a few basic requirements for intermittent ventilation systems. One, an automatic control must be installed. This ensures the fan operates for the minimum amount of time needed to meet the ventilation requirement. Two, the ventilation fan must operate at least 10% of the time. And three, the fan I didn't try to stop it, but it stopped it. That's not a bad thing, because I'm over time. So basically, um, this is just a sample. There are how many hours of this that we produced? So for the next two hours, you have to sit in here and watch. <laughs> um, anyway, I ran over. I. Thank you. 